Good morning. Hey, welcome in the name of Jesus Christ. And uh, um, I, I invite you to use this opportunity during the prelude to prepare for our worship this day. So.
Once again, uh, good morning and welcome in the name of Jesus Christ to this Lord's Day worship of God. Special welcome to each of you. And as I am sharing some of the announcements in the bulletin, I would invite and encourage you to please make use of the Ministry of Friendship pew pad. Uh, those of you closest to the aisle will find that beside you, please pick it up, provide the information requested, and share it with your neighbor beside whom you're worshiping this morning. Uh, several announcements. Um, one next Sunday um, at 9.30, so if you, if you come just before Sunday school and come to the sanctuary, we are going to have our uh, called meeting of the congregation, and we'll be hearing from our congregational nominating committee, and they'll be presenting nominees for election uh, to the offices of elder and trustee, and that's next Sunday, 9.30, here in the sanctuary, so please put that on your calendar as well. Also, um, uh, next Sunday, we get to stay for church after this service and have uh, uh, the best lunch of the month of November, guaranteed. So uh, can't beat that guarantee. So uh, our Congregational Life Council is putting together our church family Thanksgiving dinner, and that's going to be uh, next Sunday uh, after uh, this service over in Fellowship Hall, and you see information about that. Uh, also, our Ageless Adventurers uh, get together on Tuesday. They're meeting here at the church at 1015, and they're going over to the uh, uh, Abbey of the Holy Cross in Clark County uh, for a tour to learn about the practices of that community. So if you are ageless and you are an adventurer, uh, you should come out and enjoy uh, great company, uh, great food, and a great time of learning. Um, we have a couple of folks who are going to share with us. So Nicole and Layla Grace are going to tell us about an exciting outreach in our community. So, Good morning. My best friend Lacey Marisi is the newest addition to the community Thanksgiving dinner. And when your best friend needs people and food to make 1,200 turkey dinners in two weeks, you find yourself giving a moment for mission. So we're here to share some important information with you about that. And in doing so, we're going to stick to some principles of how we know your brain will remember it the best because it is so important. Number one, people stop paying attention after eight minutes. Well, this is a moment for mission, so we're good there. Number two, people learn best with repetition of familiar routines. You likely have heard these needs and facts before, so here they are again, and they are important. So the team really needs donations of food and of money. Um, there's not a place in the budget for this meal, and there aren't being turkeys donated this year. So if you're able to donate turkeys um, or pies or a monetary gift, please do so. Turkeys can be dropped, and pies can be dropped off here on Wednesday the 23rd between 2 and 5. If you can be here on Thanksgiving Day, they need bodies um, to cook, to carve turkeys, to deliver turkeys, to clean up, to wash dishes, so they can certainly use your help. Number three, people tend to remember emotional elements versus facts. Ever since we started attending this church, my family has wanted to be able to serve at the community Thanksgiving dinner. And every year between traveling or hosting, we just couldn't figure out how to make it work. So like many of you, we shared a pie and a turkey or two on Wednesday. Last year, for the first time, we were able to serve, and the experience le left us both amazed and inspired. Amazed by the generosity of donations, volunteers, and, organiza and the organization it took to serve over 1,200 turkeys dinners in just a few hours, and inspired by the energy flowing in and out of our fellowship doors through volunteers and guests. I got to serve the pies, which makes everyone happy. It was really the best part of our day. In his book, The Irresistible Revolution, Shane Claiborne shares, it's a beautiful thing when folks in poverty are no longer just a missions project, but become genuine friends and family with whom we laugh, cry, dream, and struggle. In John 15:15, 15, 15, when Jesus was preparing to leave his disciples, he said, I no longer call you servants, instead I call you friends. Come out and help in some way this Thanksgiving and enjoy the gift you receive in being a friend to those in our community. And finally, number four, people learn best when moving. 
So pray about this event, but when you're praying, move. Move your feet to the hallway to sign up on the bulletin board or online to sign up, and move yourself to the church to help make our community Thanksgiving din dinner a meal worthy of our friends and neighbors. Thank you. And uh, Peggy Clark is here to tell us all about the CCAP Christmas tree. In the event you don't have a very small person in your life, Christmas is six weeks from today. We also are doing the turkeys today, and so um, today was, was bring a turkey to church day. If, if you didn't get to bring a turkey to church today for CCAP, if you want to take one down to the CCAP building any morning this week, they would welcome that gift. Um, the CCAP Christmas tree has been put up in the gathering space already, and it has the beautiful Christmas ornaments on it. Those are the, the symbols of our faith, and lots of little tags with gift ideas for our neighbors in need. The rich man asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Our CCAP neighbors are the little girl on a scholarship in your daughter's preschool class. The mom who picks up her child after school who's always late because she sleeps during the day and works nights. The boy in your son's class who gets picked on because he smells bad, because he sleeps on the floor at his aunt's house. The girl who struggles to get her schoolwork done because she has to watch her siblings every night while her mom works. The child who never seems to have the right clothes on for the weather, who wears beat up shoes and has no winter coat the families we see everywhere we go. These are the families that CCAP serves, who are so desperately want to give their children gifts for Christmas, but they're just struggling to get by. Each year, our church and other local churches make Christmas joyous for these struggling local families by providing gifts for their children. Please take several tags off the Christmas tree and bring back your new unwrapped gifts and place them under the tree. You're also welcome to bring, if you have something at home that you think a child would like for Christmas, you don't have to have it on the tag. You can just bring it on. Um, our youth will help this year to make the, take the gifts to Mount Carmel Church on December 10th to be distributed the following week. On behalf of the hundreds of families who will be doing their Christmas shopping at Mount Carmel in a few weeks, I thank you for your continued generosity to our neighbors in need. Thank you very much. Peggy, thank you. Also, our congregation uh, has the practice of the Sunday closest to Veterans Day, which was Friday, of uh, honoring and recognizing folks in our congregation who have served our nation in our military services. So at this time, I would like veterans who are present to please stand. And on behalf of a grateful congregation, thank you very much. Our children's choir with their leaders have been working very hard, so let us now prepare our hearts and minds as they lead us into worship this day.
Amen. Thank you guys so very much. I would invite you to uh, join me as together uh, we call ourselves to worship. We give thanks to you, Lord, for you have done marvelous things. When we were kneeling in weakness, you were there, you were there. When we were needing forgiveness, you were there, you were there. We give thanks to you, Lord, for you have done marvelous things. Together, let us offer our sin to God using the prayer before us in the bulletin, followed by silence and an opportunity for personal confession. Let us pray. O God, still creating, we hear your promises of a new day of joy and peace, and we are skeptical. We expect things to go on the same as they always have, from bad to worse. The past will keep us guilty, the future will make us afraid, and the present will burden us with too little time and too much to do. Forgive our lack of faith, our quickness to believe that you do not hear us, and our pessimism about tomorrow. Do a new thing in our hearts, and let us be glad and rejoice in your abundant care. Through Christ we pray, amen.
Hear now this declaration of forgiveness. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. In the name of Christ we are forgiven. May the God of mercy who forgives us all our sins strengthen us in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep us in eternal life. Amen. Be seated, please. This time I'd like to invite the younger children to come forward for our children's message. Good morning. And so this morning I wanted to ask you, what are some things that you are thankful for? What are you thankful for? For Jesus' birthday, which is coming soon. What's another thing? For our families. Mm -hmm. For family. For candles. All right. Kyle, what are you thankful for? For turkeys. Katie. Toys, food, shelter, for friends, lots of things. Um, so that is all stuff that makes me feel really thankful as I think about all those things that I'm thankful for too. All of what you mentioned are gifts that God has given us. So there's a word that you may have been hearing in church this fall. The word is stewardship. So stewardship is the word that helps us think of how we manage the wonderful gifts that God has given us. So we know that God has given us many, many, many good things, and we wouldn't want to waste or misuse those precious and special gifts. So the biggest part of, good, of a good, being a good steward is remembering that everything we have is a gift from God and that we want to give some of what we have back to God. Um, so one of the things that we can give back to God, the, the blessings that we have, is money. So I have some money today. And so I actually have 10 $1 bills. So the Bible says God would like us to give one of every 10 that we have, whether that's dollars or whether that's um, a portion of some of the other types of things that we have. Um, the Bible also says that God wants us to give generously so that we give as much as we're able. So we'll have that for God. Um, the, when, when people put money in the offering plates that come around during our worship service, those are all things that go to support God's work in our church and in our world. Um, but there are other things that we can give God besides our money. Um, what are some other things that we could give to God? What do you think? Mm -hmm. Food and shelter and what else? Like toys. 
some of the, the extra things that we maybe have. Those are things that we can provide for other people who don't have them. Our prayers, very good. What's another one? Mm -hmm. Share our love with, with our families. You're right. Um, so there's lots of things that we can share. You guys, a lot of you have sang this morning. You shared your gift of singing with the church and with God. Um, that's right. We, we can share by doing special projects. Um, so tonight there is actually a project at church at 5 o'clock um, where you can come and help us make kits for people who face disasters. Um, so there are many ways that we can give our money and our time and our gifts to God um, as, a, as our act of stewardship. All right, so if you would join me in a word of prayer and congregation, join along with us. Let's pray. Dear God, Dear God you've given us so much. Help us use part of what you've given to serve and honor you. Amen. All right. Thank you very much. The children may uh, return to their families or go out to We One's worship. And while they're doing that, let us take a few moments to greet neighbors. And if you need to get up and do that, that's just fine. So say howdy. Boy, I love a friendly church. The scripture lesson this morning is from the Gospel according to Luke. I will not be reading the Isaiah passage. However, if you wish to assign that to yourself for this afternoon, um, I'll give you a quiz next Sunday. So, but the passage from Luke is from the 21st chapter, reading verses 5 through 19. And uh, to give you a little insight into this sermon, um, you know, over the years that I've been doing this, I've, it's, it's an odd thing to go on vacation the Sunday prior to when you're going to preach. 
it means it's not truly a vacation because you're constantly thinking about this. So I found that I have to write this before I even go away and, and hoping what the Spirit said in the study that week is still relevant on the Sunday I stand to do this. And of course, ultimately, that's your judgment. Um, but it's kind of nice to have written this sermon before I knew how the election was going to play out and to see if the gospel is still the gospel regardless of what our republic happened to choose on election day. So we'll find that out in the course of the sermon as well. So um, let us now s listen for what the Spirit has to say to the church this day. This is Jesus talking to his disciples uh, in front of the temple in Jerusalem. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, as for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. They asked him, teacher, when will this be and what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, beware that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be great earthquakes and in various places famines and plagues, and there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our presidential election is now in the rear view mirror. The campaign has been long and hard fought, which is to be expected since the stakes were and are high. The American people have now elected our 45th president. You know, sadly, there has been no small measure of acrimony, which, by the way, has been true of campaigns since the very dawn of our beloved republic. For example, the barbs cast by Jefferson and Adams at one another in 1800 were far from genteel. Listen to what Thomas Jefferson had to say about then President Adams. He is a hideous, hermaphroditical character, which has neither the force and firmness of a man nor the gentleness and sensibility of a woman. And listen to what John Adams had to say about Thomas Jefferson. He is a mean-spirited, low-lived fellow, the son of a half-breed Indian squaw sired by a Virginia mulatto father. Now after the campaign, the two men became the fastest of friends for their own sake and for the sake of a very young republic, a friendship that is on display in the many letters they wrote to one another over the next quarter of a century of their remaining lives. It could be that there is something about power that leads folks to say 
or do almost anything to get it and to keep it and to wield it. And this is a spiritual issue. Perhaps someday we will learn to be more honorable and noble in our politics, and with God's help, I believe we can do it. I pray that we will do it. And of course, it will have to start with us. Nobody is going to make it better for us. We have to do it. You know, our political perspectives and preferences, though deeply important, are only a piece of who we are. And a small one at that, the heart of who we are is children of God, made in God's image, redeemed by Christ, brothers and sisters to one another, members of one human family. You know, we are now nearly two and a half centuries into our experiment with representative democracy, something that the world had not seen sustained over a period of time, something the world has waited to fail, a government of the people and by the people and for the people. You know, 153 years ago at Gettysburg in the midst of our nation's civil war, a fearful time, if ever there was one, a time where surely Republican democratic government was going to fail. President Abraham Lincoln memorialized the nation's war dead whose sacrifice and battle helped to ensure the survival of the still young republic. And 75 years ago, President Franklin Roosevelt delivered perhaps his most famous speech. It was his annual State of the Union address to Congress and the nation in January of 1941. The world was at war, and within the year, the United States would be attacked at Pearl Harbor by Imperial Japan. Again, a fearful time, if ever there was one. And Roosevelt declared that people the world over should enjoy freedom of worship and speech and freedom from want and fear and committed the United States to pursuing these four freedoms around the globe. And on November the 11th, 1918, The Allies and Germany signed a peace treaty at Compagna, France, bringing to an end hostilities on World War I's Western Front. The treaty was signed at the 11th hour on the 11th day of the 11th month because it felt as if civilization was in its 11th hour as Christian Europe slaughtered one another. There were no guarantees that the treaty would hold, and given the ferocity of the war, fear for what lay ahead for Europe was palpable. In 1954, Armistice Day became Veterans Day in the United States, a day on which we as a nation honor persons who have served in our own armed forces. Now I know you didn't come to church for either a civics lesson or a history lesson. You came to hear the gospel and I came to preach the gospel. But you know by now that history is going to show up somehow, somewhere in my sermons now and again. And here is what I glean from these three pieces of information from our nation's history. In our history, we have faced woe and trouble of the highest magnitude. There have been times when the lights went out and we did not know if or when they might come on again. No doubt we felt and tasted fear itself, but it wasn't our first or our prevailing impulse. Our first impulse 
the prevailing impulse was determination born by hope. It was to endure because that's who we are. Not fearful, but hopeful, determined, enduring. Who doesn't like a sure thing? You know, we want to know what's going to happen. We need to know what's going to happen. To us, the people we love most dearly, to our congregation, to our community, to our beloved institutions, to our nation, to our world, we want constants. You know, the unknown and the unknowable unnerve us. Not knowing generates anxiety and fear. Today's lesson from Luke has Jesus and the disciples at the temple in Jerusalem. And the temple was a sight to behold. It was the center of Jewish cultural life, Jewish religious life, Jewish national life. Its beauty was without compare. God's very presence inhabited the temple. If ever something was going to last forever, it was the temple in Jerusalem. And Jesus overhears conversations about the temple's grandeur. He tells his disciples that it is something indeed, but when you tally up the things that will last, the things that will endure, the temple isn't one of them. After all, it's a building. There will come a day when the temple isn't anymore, just as there will come a day when the disciples themselves will be no more. Jesus, call, Jesus remarks calls a good deal of consternation. You know, the disciples want to know when. They want to know how. They want to know by whose hand. And implied in their questions is how can God abide such a thing as the destruction of God's abode. And what follows is an apocalyptic discourse by Jesus. Apocalypticism involves the belief that the world will come to an end very soon, even in one's own lifetime. And in part, the gospel writers of the New Testament present Jesus as something of an apocalyptic prophet whose mission included preparing people for the world's end. And apocalypticism appeals to our strong desire to know what's going to happen to us and to everything, especially when the present moment generates more fear-inducing moments than we know what to do with. We want and need to know that someone like God is sovereign, is reliably in charge. You know, Christians have long been divided on just how to read the apocalyptic passages of the New Testament. Are they words that threaten judgment and the hope that those who read or hear them will amend their ways and get right with God and neighbor and begin to set their society right as well? And there is nothing wrong with reading it this way. I want to amend my ways. I want to be right with God and you. I want us all to get to work setting our society right. I want everyone to amend their ways and get right with God and neighbor. Or are these apocalyptic words of assurance that allay the fears that in the face of serious trouble, God is absent and life is meaningless? that God isn't taking notice and will not show up and life will come to nothing. The words are meant to say this, that God is always present, that God always has matters 
well in hand, despite appearances otherwise, the words are designed to vanquish fear and to instill hope. The words seek to help us endure come what may. You know, there's something else about apocalyptic language. Should we read it as prescriptive or descriptive? You know, is Jesus prescribing how things are going to go down? Is he giving us a, a road map of the future? Or is Jesus describing how things have already gone down and providing theological commentary? You know, here are some of the things we know. Jesus died between the years 30 and 36. The temple was reduced to rubble in the year 70 at the hands of Emperor Titus's second in command, General Tiberius Julius Alexander, in the siege of Jerusalem. Luke's gospel was written between the years 80 and 90. Here is one reading of our passage today, given that historical timeline. Luke knew what had become of the temple. It was no more. Luke also knew of Jesus' words to the disciples concerning the temple and its impermanence. He also knew of other false and untrustworthy leaders who presented themselves as knowing the full mind of God and gathering followings with their false certitudes. He also knew how very hard it was to be either Jewish or Christian in the years following the Roman sack of Jerusalem and the subsequent martial rule of the Levant. Times were terrible for God's people. Fear was high for God's people. And Luke weaves all of this into a narrative that tells people where God is, that tells people what God is up to, and tells people how they can endure. Luke assures his readers and us that God is near, that God is saving all of humanity, and that God has matters well in hand. And we who bear the name Christian, who trust this news, will endure through hope come what may. You know, the Gospels are stories, albeit stories with a serious theological punch. And every story, like lives, has a beginning and a middle and an ending. And those are the three fundamental elements of every plot. Beginnings we know. We can turn around and look back and see how things got started, where things came from. Middles are a little tougher because that's where we are at the moment. We are in the thick of things, and endings are a lot tougher. We know the end is out there somewhere, and as we get closer to it, we can begin to make out some of its contours, but for the most part, it remains ill-defined. As certain as we would like it to be, we just don't have as much control over it as we like to think we have. The challenge as Christians is living in the middle before the end with our souls intact, with grace and with dignity. You know, this wasn't easy for Jesus' first disciples. It wasn't easy for Jesus' disciples across the last 20 centuries. It isn't easy for Jesus' disciples today. As I said before, not knowing what is exactly across the hill or around the bend or beyond the river is unsettling. As much as we would like to know, we are going to have to trust and to believe and to hope. 
Luke tells us about Jesus because Jesus shows us what trust in God looks like. You know, recently I read Brian McLaren's new book, The Great Spiritual Migration, how the world's largest religion is seeking a better way to be Christian. And in his book, McLaren identifies three major shifts or movements within Christianity. He calls them migrations. And I think he's on to something. The first shift is spiritual. Christians We are divining ourselves less and less by faith as belief and more and more by faith as a way of life defined by love. And the second shift is theological. Christians were talking about God less and less in terms of a harsh, scorekeeping, supreme being and more and more in terms of a renewing spirit at work in the world for good. And the third shift is missional. Christians, we are becoming less interested in organized religion and more interested in organizing religion, namely religion as a movement that seeks to heal and to make peace and alleviate poverty and address injustice all in the name of Jesus Christ. I don't believe we as creatures will ever stop fretting over what we don't know. It's just something we do, especially something as big as what is going to become of us and everyone and everything we love. We, we want to know the particulars of the ending. We can't. We won't. And it may make us nervous, frightened. However, and here is the gospel, by focusing on God's nearness to us and God's mission of saving the whole wide world and everyone in it and doing our part in partnership with God, suddenly our needing and having to know will become less important our fretting will diminish because our hope will be restored and we, with God's help, will endure. You know, I know that the baseball season is over and I'm gonna shed a tear right now, you're gonna watch. See it? It's a shame it cannot go year round, but I get it, if I was a 30-year-old young man, I couldn't play 162 games, that's a long season. One of my favorite authors, Anne Lamott, uses a baseball image to describe the foundation of her Christian hope, a hope that helps her endure. She says, God bats last. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have promised to hear when we pray in the name of your Son. In confidence and trust, we pray this day for your church, your church here in Winchester, your church in Ethiopia, your church in Guatemala, your church in Bangladesh. Enliven us for mission that we may be salt of the earth and light to the world. Breathe your life into us. And Lord, we pray for our world. Creator of all, lead us and every people into ways of justice and peace that we may respect one another in freedom and in truth. And we pray for our nation. God of truth, inspire with your wisdom those whose decisions affect the lives of others that they may act with integrity and courage. We pray for President Obama and Vice President Biden and for President-elect Trump and Vice President-elect Pence. We pray for the members of our Congress and the justices of our courts. We pray for each and every 
citizen of our republic. May we act with integrity and with courage. Give grace to all whose lives are linked with ours. We pray for neighbors in need this day. God of hope, comfort and restore all who suffer, whether in body, mind or spirit. We pray for Edward Swartz. We lift before you the families who are grieving, who have suffered loss. The family of Barbara Hicks, of Kathy Smith, of Noel Feliciano. Lord, you have called each and every one of us to serve you. Grant that we may minister in your name with your love in our hearts, your truth in our minds, your strength in our wills, until at the end of our journey, we know the joy of our homecoming and the welcome of your embrace. And now with the confidence of the children of God, we pray the prayer Jesus taught us saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive us debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Be seated, please. Today we are also invited along with our tithes and offerings to present our stewardship commitments for 2017. 
With gladness, let us now present the offering of our life and our labor to God. One worship note, I have a 12.30 commitment at Burnt Presbyterian Church, and to accommodate a long-winded preacher, we're going to sing the last verse of the final hymn, So, and everybody gets to lunch on time. How's that? Shall we pray? Blessed are you, God of all creation. It is through your goodness that we have these gifts to share. Accept and use us and our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Amen. Oh,